Backstage Benny and the Majestic Park Theater. Written by Daniel Tobias. Read by the author. Chapter One, The Majestic Park Theater. Uncle Riley swung the stage door open at the Majestic Park Theater and said with a big smile, You're about to have the most exciting adventure of your life, Benny. His words were almost drowned out by a honking taxi on the street behind them, a group of noisy tourists to their right, and a man in a booth loudly selling hot dogs to their left. The sounds of New York City roared all around them. The stage door was attached to a giant stone building with lots of brass double doors. Above the stage door, in the setting sun, bright lights lit up a balcony divided by thick round pillars. Above the pillars, the roof sloped away from the street and disappeared into the sky high above. Halfway up the outside wall was a large golden sign, brightly lit with large letters that spelled his uncle's name, Riley Freeman. Below his name, in even larger letters, were the words Cyrano de Bergerac. Uncle Riley had explained earlier that day that Cyrano de Bergerac is a very old and very funny play. Benny and Uncle Riley entered the stage door. The inside was narrow and dark. The walls and furniture were sort of dingy, but in spite of the drab interior, Benny felt a feeling that anything could happen inside this building. Dreams could happen. Magic could happen. An old man with a white mustache looked up from a small wooden desk. Benny, Uncle Riley said, this is Jacobs. Bernie Jacobs at your service, the old man said. Jacobs guards the stage door to make sure only those with permission may enter the theater. Benny looked to the ground and asked, do I have permission to enter? Jacobs responded, Well, what's your name? Benny Beaumont. My Uncle Riley's name is in big letters outside. Jacobs winked at Uncle Riley. Riley Freeman is your uncle? In that case, you certainly may enter. Benny smiled shyly. He reached into his jacket pocket to fish out a small white mouse with black whiskers, fuzzy pink ears, and a long pink tail. And this, Benny said, is vanilla. Jacobs pinched his eyebrows together, slid his glasses down the bridge of his nose to the tip, and leaned forward to take a closer look at the mouse. Vanilla squeaked to say, Hello! Unauthorized pets aren't allowed in the Majestic Park Theater, Jacobs stated. Benny quickly covered Vanilla and slipped her back into his pocket. Rules, explained Jacobs. Rules are very important, especially in theater. Benny nodded, looking down at the floor. However, Jacobs continued, I think I might be able to pretend I never saw vanilla. Uncle Riley smiled and said, Thanks, Jacobs. Jacobs stretched his arms out to the dark hall beyond his desk and raised his voice. Welcome, Benny, to the Majestic Park Theater. Benny's heart raced as Uncle Riley led him down the dark hall. They rounded a corner. Busy people hurried up and down the hall, in and out of doors. Each door, Uncle Riley explained as they walked, leads to places that are very important to the magic of theater. This leads to the prop room. This leads to the costume room. This door leads down to the basement. This door leads up to the dressing rooms. This door leads out to the audience. And you'll get to see everything. But first, I want to take you somewhere most people never get to go. The stage. Growing up, he'd heard his Uncle Riley was a very famous actor. He was told Uncle Riley mostly performs in New York City in a district of big theaters called Broadway, and rarely does he ever perform in small theaters in small cities. Most theaters, Benny's mother had explained, can't afford a big star like your Uncle Riley. But here Benny was, in New York City, on Broadway, about to step foot on the same stage that Uncle Riley performs on. Benny was so excited. Chapter 2 
Chapter 2 The Stage They passed through a door painted in black. Benny found himself surrounded by thick black curtains that stretched from the wooden floor so high above they disappeared in blackness. This area is called the wings, Uncle Riley said, which is just a fancy way of saying backstage. Always be careful in the wings. Set pieces, props, technicians, and actors need to rush in and out of the wings. It's easy to get squished here. Benny cupped his hand in his pocket around Vanilla, fearing for her life among all the danger that could squish her. Benny and Uncle Riley passed through the curtains into a vast opening beyond. And out here is the stage, said Uncle Riley. Benny turned to face the enormous theater auditorium. It seemed to Benny his entire house back home in Indianapolis, as well as both neighbors' houses, could fit inside the auditorium. Red seats stretched from wall to wall on the lower level, as well as the curved balcony suspended above. Everything seemed to glow in gold or disappear in a shadowy red. Four massive, gleaming crystal chandeliers hovered above the seats, sparkling with thousands of tiny shards of glass. Wow, Benny exclaimed. Uncle Riley said, There are 2,000 seats in front of you. Benny took out his phone to take a picture of the auditorium. Careful, cried Uncle Riley, pulling Benny back. Benny hadn't realized he had stepped right to the edge of the stage. Directly beneath his toes was a six-foot drop to a narrow trench with a curved wall. That's called the orchestra pit, explained Uncle Riley. That's where the musicians sit, the people who play the piano, violin, viola, cello, trumpet, trombone, tuba, and drums. Benny dropped to his knees and cautiously crawled to the edge. He could see that the orchestra pit continued underneath the stage. Benny asked, If the show is going to begin soon, where are all the musicians? Uncle Riley laughed. I'm not performing in a musical tonight, Benny. We're doing a play. No singing, just dialogue. Just a bunch of actors saying terribly clever things. <laughs> Benny crawled away from the edge and moved to the center of the enormous stage. He planted his feet on the wood floor. He imagined he was Uncle Riley, standing before 2,000 people. He felt so small. His heart started fluttering and his forehead started sweating. Benny's throat tightened up and his mouth dried. He asked, Don't you get scared in front of all those people? Yes, every night when I'm waiting in the wings, I get nervous, but the moment I step on stage, I stop feeling scared. I don't think I could ever do what you do. I'd get so nervous, Benny cried. Uncle Riley replied, Remember last summer when you and I went on that roller coaster at Holiday World? Benny recalled that fast wooden roller coaster and responded, Yes, the Voyager. How did you feel when the chain pulled us up the first hill? I had butterflies in my stomach. And then how did you feel after the hill? Benny recalled. We were going too fast to feel anything. Or, Uncle Riley suggested, perhaps so much excitement collided into your brain at one time that the ride just flew by in a blur? Yes, yes, that's it. Uncle Riley smiled. That's how I feel when I go on stage. Even though that made sense, Benny still didn't feel like he'd ever be able to step in front of 2,000 people without feeling frightened. Little did Benny know, in less than a month, Benny would indeed be on that stage in front of 2,000 people. Chapter 3, The Dressing Room Suddenly, a brown-haired woman pushed her way between Benny and Uncle Riley. Move it, she barked. We're testing the set now. She motioned to them with her bright yellow clipboard to skedaddle off the stage. Benny didn't understand what she meant by testing the set. 
As they walked off the stage, Uncle Riley whispered, That's Victoria. She's our stage manager. Never, ever get in her way. Benny replied, She's mean. Uncle Riley smiled. Mm, even I'm scared of her. One thing you'll learn is that there are all sorts of people in this theater. They all have very important jobs to do, but they don't all do it nicely, like at your school. Victoria may be prickly sometimes, but she does her job very, very well. We're lucky to have her. We could not do this show without her. Follow me. As they walked off the stage between the curtains, Benny saw several thin walls slide from the wings to the center of the stage. They rolled along narrow grooves in the floor. Painted on these walls was an old bakery filled with bread, flour, and a wood-burning stove. Benny was fascinated by how smoothly and quietly the painted walls moved. He imagined little gears, thin, tight wires, and small brass wheels. He wanted to know how they were operated and who operated them. Suddenly, the bakery rotated counterclockwise. In fact, the entire center of the stage was rotating. Uncle Riley explained, That's called a turntable. Benny exclaimed, That's so cool! And so expensive, Uncle Riley replied. Benny took his phone out to take a photo. No, Benny, Uncle Riley said, covering the phone. Nobody is allowed to take pictures of the set. Why not? asked Benny. It's one of the rules of the theater. The producers of this show are afraid someone might see the photo and try to copy it. They're afraid if there are copies of the set in other parts of the world, then less people will show up to our show here, and we'd lose money. Benny put his phone away. Come on, Benny, Uncle Riley said. It's time for you to meet my favorite person at the Majestic. Uncle Riley and Benny exited the wings. They stepped up a flight of metal stairs. People rushed down in the opposite direction. Some made no eye contact. Some smiled and called out, Hiya, Riley! Everybody in New York City seemed to move to a rhythm much faster than he was used to back home in Indiana. They continued up two more flights of stairs and stood before a door with a sign reading, Riley Freeman. Uncle Riley opened the door. This is my dressing room, my home away from home until Cyrano de Bergerac closes, Uncle Riley added with a wink, which hopefully won't be for at least a year. And now, said a cheerful voice from the far corner of the room, it's your home away from home too. A short man with a shiny bald head and a dark black mustache approached Benny and extended his hand. Mucho gusto. I'm Salvador. Benny shook his hand and said, I'm Benny. Salvador wore blue jean overalls and had a happy twinkle in his eye. Benny instantly liked this short man with his big, friendly smile. Uncle Riley explained, Salvador is my dresser. He helps me with my costumes, my wig, and my makeup. But most of all, he's my good friend. We've worked together for, gosh, how many years now? Salvador responded, 33 years. Wow, cried Benny. I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Choked Salvador, passing his hand over his bald, shiny head. I barely look more than 20 years old. <laughs> Benny laughed as he withdrew vanilla from his pocket. This is vanilla, introduced Benny. Salvador bent down to let the little mouse sniff the tip of his nose. Encantado, vanilla. I'm Salvador. Vanilla gave a friendly little squeak and licked his nose repeatedly. I think Vanilla and I will be great friends, said Salvador. Either that or I might have some strawberry frosting on my nose. Benny smiled and stroked Vanilla's back as he glanced around the dressing room. A large mirror hung above a big wooden desk. On the desk were a lot of little makeup bottles, brushes, and black combs. Next to the desk were some shelves. On one shelf rested a wig of long black curly hair. On another shelf was a set of framed photos. One photo was of Benny's dad and his mom, holding Benny when he was just a little baby.
His dad wore a green army uniform with gleaming medals hanging from his pocket. Benny barely remembered his dad, but he recognized the army uniform. His mom kept it wrapped in tissue paper in a box in the back of her bedroom closet in their house in Indianapolis. Uncle Riley's cell phone began to vibrate. He pulled it out of his pocket and read the screen. A worried look crept over Uncle Riley's face. I'll be right back, boys, he said. I've got to talk to the boss. He means the show's director, Hudson Hayes, Salvador explained. Benny watched Uncle Riley exit quickly and ask, Is something bad happening? Uncle Riley looked worried. Hudson and your uncle have worked together for a long time, Salvador replied. This is their fifth show together. She's as talented as your uncle. Whatever the problem, there's nothing they can't fix together. Benny still felt concerned. He'd never seen that worried expression on his uncle's face before. Suddenly, they were both rudely startled by a loud, sharp rapping on the dressing room door. Well, that can only be one person, Salvador said in a low voice. Hide the mouse! Benny quickly slid Vanilla into his pocket. Salvador then sang, Adelante, Victoria! The door opened abruptly and Victoria entered, waving her yellow clipboard. She barked, Thirty minutes to curtain! Victoria turned her attention to Benny. Benny turned his attention to the desk and started picking at the little crack in the wood with his fingernail. Don't let me see you out of this room, Victoria commanded. Little boy, do you hear me? Benny nodded. I asked you a question, she demanded. Yes, I, I hear you, Benny muttered quietly. Good, Victoria said sternly. Now stop! Picking at that desk. Show it some respect. Do you know who sat there in front of that very mirror? Benny shook his head. Victoria continued her attack. Constance Collier, and I'm sure she never picked at her desk. Please tell me you know who Constance Collier is. Benny shook his head again, sinking even lower into the corner. Victoria fired at Salvador. This little boy has no idea who Constance Collier is, Salvador tried to speak. Victoria. Ignoring him, Victoria pointed to a small black and white photo hanging on a wall near the entrance door. In an old silver frame was a photo of an elderly lady with dark hair piled up on top of her head, a shiny pearl necklace draped around her neck. She was not smiling, yet her face seemed somehow wise and loving. Educate yourself, little boy, Victoria ordered, and don't ever not know who Constance Collier is again. Salvador spoke. Victoria, you cannot blame Benny if his parents never taught him about Constance Collier. Well, of course I can, Victoria persisted loudly. That boy ought to have picked his parents more carefully. Victoria turned sharply on her heels in irritation, marched out the dressing room, slamming the door behind her. Vanilla squeaked loudly inside Benny's pocket. No le hagas caso, Salvador chuckled. Don't let her get to you, Benny. She treats everybody like that. Benny nodded, looking closely at the black and white photo. Constance Collier's eyes seemed to be looking right at him. It felt almost like this old woman in the black and white photo was trying to say something to Benny. Benny asked, Who? Who is Constance Collier? Miss Collier was a very famous actress and coach. She acted in a play called The Merry Wives of Windsor in this very theater. She sat right here at this desk. She died a half a century ago. This old theater has a lot of history. Will Uncle Riley be part of its history? asked Benny. Definitivo, Benny, Salvador responded. Your uncle will be a big part of its history, especially after this production of Cyrano de Bergerac. Your uncle and Hudson Hayes have created magic on that stage. I can't wait to see it, Salvador asked. 
Have you ever seen a play before? I, I saw Aladdin when we traveled to Chicago two years ago. But Cyrano de Bergerac isn't a musical. Uncle Riley said there's no singing. That's right, Salvador agreed. But you know how Aladdin had one intermission which divided two acts? Yes. Cyrano de Bergerac has five acts. Five acts, exclaimed Benny. It's long, said Salvador. Still want to see it? Yes. Then I have a surprise for you, Salvador exclaimed, leaping to the left of the desk. Chapter 4 The Sliding Door Salvador took hold of a curious little handle and pulled. A wide door slid open like a closet door. The opening revealed a view of the very wings Benny and Uncle Riley had walked through only a couple minutes before, only from the height of 30 feet. Through the wings, way down below, Benny could see the stage. The stage lights were now at eye level. The enormous black curtains in the wings now hung right in front of him. Benny could practically reach out and touch the edge of the curtains. Wow! exclaimed Benny. From up here, you get the best seats in the house, Salvador said. There's Uncle Riley, Benny whispered. On the opposite side of the stage, way down below, Benny spied Uncle Riley. Uncle Riley was listening with his arms crossed to a woman with a baseball cap on, speaking urgently. Her blonde hair stuck through the back of the cap in a ponytail, which whipped from side to side as she spoke. Your uncle is talking to Hudson Hayes, the director, Salvador explained. It looks important. Benny noticed there were a lot of other people walking on and off the stage. He saw many actors in costumes and a bunch of people rushing around dressed in black, wearing headsets with microphones. A couple people swept the floor. Others carried props onto the stage and placed them carefully on pieces of furniture on the set. Are all these people as important as Uncle Riley? asked Benny. Jace, Benny. Without the producer, he'd have no stage to go out on. Without the director, he'd have nothing to do on stage. Without the costumer, he can't go on stage. Without the lighting technician, nobody would see him on stage. Every person here has a starring role to play. Make sense? Benny nodded. There are no more important or less important people in theater, Salvador said. And now that you're here, you're equally important too. But I'm only here because Mommy is in the hospital and she asked Uncle Riley to take care of me, Benny said. Salvador knelt down in order to look Benny directly in his eyes. Remember when you and your uncle went to Central Park on Monday? Yes, Benny replied. Remember all the trees? Yes. Do you think every tree was planted by one person? I guess not, Salvador continued. Some trees were planted on purpose. Some started as seeds dropped by birds, and some seeds blew in accidentally by the wind. But they're all part of what makes Central Park beautiful and colorful. Each tree is important, no matter how they got there. Theater is like that. Everybody here arrived at the majestic park theater by different ways. Some, like your Uncle Riley, were brought here by important people. Some, like Jacobs, landed here as they were trying to get somewhere else and decided to stay. And some, like you, were blown here by the wind. But the important thing is, we're all here together now. 
We are all part of what makes this theater beautiful and colorful now. Does that make sense? Penny didn't really see how all these people were like trees. In fact, the loud and hectic atmosphere in front of him seemed more like the opposite of the sunny day he spent in Central Park. But Benny didn't want to disappoint Salvador, so he nodded his head anyway. Benny and Salvador watched his uncle and Hudson Hayes nod in agreement and then separate. Uncle Riley strode quickly into the wings and disappeared through the doorway below. All right, Benny, Salvador began. Your uncle is on his way to get ready for the performance, and it takes a while to attach this. Salvador displayed a five-inch triangular-shaped object. What is it? Benny asked. Salvador answered, A big nose. It goes on your Uncle Riley's face so he can play the role of Cyrano de Bergerac. The door flew open. Uncle Riley strode in and sat in the chair in front of the mirror. His expression was urgent and worried. Stern lips replaced his warm smile. Benny was alarmed. Let's get to work, Uncle Riley said to Salvador. As Salvador started applying little dabs of odd flesh-colored mud around Uncle Riley's real nose, Benny could see Uncle Riley struggling with his thoughts. Benny, there's something you should know about theater, Uncle Riley began. As much as we love it, it's never a constant thing. You can never just rest and let it happen. Everybody always needs to work hard to keep it running well. Benny watched Salvador affix the large five-inch nose over Uncle Riley's nose and paste the edges with the mud. Is there a problem with Cyrano de Bergerac? asked Benny. All the reviewers call the show a masterpiece. Beautiful, funny, exciting, and touching, Uncle Riley said. He lowered his voice. The sales, however, the ticket sales, they're not so strong. Why not? Benny asked. As Salvador started to dab flesh-colored makeup to the nose, Uncle Riley explained, It's difficult to get modern audiences to pay a hundred dollars per ticket to see a three-hour classic play. The old language in Cyrano de Bergerac requires concentration. A lot of folks in this country aren't good at concentration. The characters are funny, but not in the way audiences are used to. When tourists come to New York City to see a Broadway show, they buy tickets for shows like The Lion King instead. Even though this is the only show on Broadway with sword fights, Benny exclaimed, there's sword fighting? Oh, is there ever, Uncle Riley answered excitedly. Uncle Riley reached to the side of the desk for a long, slim, silver sword. He whipped it through the air back and forth and then pointed it towards Benny. The best sword fighting you'll ever see in your life, and it's completely alive. Cool, cried Benny. Tranquilo, Riley, ordered Salvador. Riley settled back in his chair as Salvador glued a black mustache above Uncle Riley's lips. Benny asked, So, what's the plan to increase ticket sales? Uncle Riley replied, We don't have a plan. There's no more money to spend on marketing. We don't know how to increase sales. What happens if you can't sell enough tickets? asked Benny. Uncle Riley and Salvador exchanged serious looks of concern. Then the show closes and we shut down, Uncle Riley answered. But there's nothing we can do about that right now. What counts is the audience before me, no matter what the size. And I'm told most of the seats on the lower level are sold out tonight. Anyway, there's a more immediate problem than ticket sales this evening. Scratch Litchington will be here. Uh-oh, Salvador said, slipping the ridiculous wig with long, dark, curly hair on Uncle Riley's head. Who's Scratch Litchington? asked Benny. Uncle Riley replied, 
Scratch Litchington is the most vile human being who has ever... Ahem. Salvador cleared his throat. I mean, Uncle Riley continued, Scratch is just doing his job. Personally, I don't think he does it very well. Salvador explained, Scratch Litchington reviews plays for a big newspaper. He always gives your uncle very poor reviews that a lot of people read. Downright nasty, vicious reviews, cried Uncle Riley. When I won a Tony Award for my performance in Shakespeare's Richard III, Scratch Litchington wrote it was the most dull dredge he'd ever witnessed on stage. Era un poquito aburrido, muttered Salvador under his breath to Benny. It was not boring, protested Uncle Riley. I don't think I'd like Scratch at all, Benny said. Well, Salvador began, there's nothing we can do about Scratch Litchington. He's watching the play tonight, like it or not. All we can do is ignore him. Uncle Riley suddenly stood and spun around, his long cape swooshing dramatically around. He withdrew his shiny sword and said, You're absolutely right. Who cares what that snake says? We have a play to perform. Vanilla squeaked at the rush of movement, turning a small circle inside Benny's pocket. Well, Benny, Uncle Riley asked in a loud, deep voice that filled the room, how do I look? Uncle Riley holstered his sword at his hip. His hair rose high above his forehead and then fell down thick and curly onto his back. Uncle Riley's grin broadened beneath his enormous five-inch nose. Benny replied, like you just told a really big lie? The three laughed. I'm off to defeat yet another unsuspecting audience, Uncle Riley stated in an accent similar to the ones Benny heard wizards use in movies. Young man, it is the tradition of theater when one is about to commence such a mission to say break a leg. Will your leg actually get broken? asked Benny. No, Salvador and Uncle Riley chuckled together. Break a leg, Uncle Riley? Thank you, sir, replied Uncle Riley, bowing from his waist grandly before swooshing his cape around and exiting the dressing room. Salvador closed the door. Benny rushed to the sliding door opening to watch the action below. Careful not to squish Vanilla, Benny lay on his stomach with his head perched on his hands, overlooking the great drop to the stage below. An enormous red curtain now blocked the stage from the audience. It was awesome to Benny to think, on the other side of that huge curtain, 2,000 people could be seated in all those chairs facing the stage, and they were all waiting to see his very own uncle. Below Benny, crowded between the tall black curtains in the wings, were several people in costumes wearing large hats with feathers sticking out of them. There was a hum on stage from all the actors and crew nervously preparing for the performance. In the shadows, he could see Victoria's bright yellow clipboard weave in and out of the curtains in the wings. Benny could hear an even louder hum of an excited audience muffled through the thick curtains separating the stage from the auditorium seats. All the energy from below seemed to pulsate through the air up to Benny's perch 30 feet above them. Then he heard a muffled announcement from the speakers on the other side of the big curtains. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off your cell phones and unwrap your candy. The performance is about to begin. The audience grew silent. Actors made their way to the stage and took their positions for the beginning of the play. He spotted his uncle standing on the opposite side of the stage, his head held high. Even from this distance, Benny could see his enormous fake nose in the dim light and the wings. Benny admired his uncle's concentration. He seemed charged with energy, yet somehow relaxed. It was almost like Benny was watching his uncle, yet watching a complete stranger at the same time. Everything about the Majestic Park Theater was so odd and scary and thrilling. Suddenly, the large red curtain lifted. The light on stage poured out into the audience. <laughs>
Chapter 5, The Play Begins. An applause greeted the actors after the curtain rose all the way. Salvador explained, They're applauding because the set is so beautiful. You can't see what they're seeing because you're only seeing the edge of the scenery. You're not getting the full effect from the front. I wish I were out there in the audience, cried Benny. You will be one day when your mom gets better and can sit next to you, Salvador said, walking to the door. I've got to wait for your uncle in the wings now. It's my job to wipe the sweat off his face when he goes off stage between scenes and make sure that big nose doesn't fall off his face. It gets very hot under all those lights down there. I'll be back in 20 minutes. Promise you won't fall out through that door? Benny grinned. I promise I won't fall out. Salvador exited and closed the door. Benny turned his attention back to all the action 30 feet below. He could hear his uncle's voice cutting through the noise, echoing off the brick walls. His uncle's voice was strong and loud, yet also colored with playfulness and glee. Vanilla squeaked from inside his pocket. Benny withdrew her and put her on his shoulder. Look, Vanilla, Benny whispered. Isn't it so cool? But Vanilla wasn't listening to Benny. She sniffed the air alertly. What do you smell, girl? asked Benny. Vanilla hopped off Benny's shoulder onto the floor near the sliding door. Come back here, Vanilla. It's a long drop if you fall. Vanilla ignored Benny. She scampered onto a small black pipe that ran high above the stage along the brick wall. The pipe was only two inches wide and stretched to the enormous wall at the back of the stage. Vanilla, whispered Benny as loud as he dared. Vanilla continued to scamper along the pipe. Suddenly, Benny saw where Vanilla was heading and what she'd smelled in the first place. Sitting on top of the far end of the pipe was a mouse trap, baited with moldy yellow cheese. Oh no, cried Benny. He held onto the edge of the sliding door with his left hand and scooted his right foot along the pipe as far as his leg could reach. He just barely managed to trap Vanilla's tail under his tennis shoe. Gotcha, Benny whispered. Vanilla squeaked in surprise. She struggled to free herself. With his left foot resting on the dressing room floor and his right leg stretched wide along the pipe, Benny looked down and realized his body was suspended above a 30-foot drop. His heart raced. His hands started to sweat, holding tightly with his left hand to the door frame. Benny started to reach his right hand down his right leg toward Vanilla. He couldn't let Vanilla reach that spring-loaded mousetrap. Suddenly, Benny felt his right foot slip off the pipe, pulling Vanilla's tail with it. Vanilla went flying off into the air, and Benny fell outward into the air. Panicked, Benny reached out towards the thick wing curtains that stretched from above his head all the way down to the stage. He caught the curtain with his right hand and quickly swung his left hand over. All his fingers clenched tightly to the edge of the curtain, yet his left foot still rested on the floor inside the dressing room. His body formed a bridge between the curtain and the sliding door opening. The curtain started to swing away due to the weight of Benny's body. Benny's eyes widened in fear. He had no choice. He swung his feet beneath him and wrapped them tightly around the black curtain. He looked down. The stage seemed even further away now. He looked to the brightly lit stage beyond the wings to see if any of the actors or crew had seen what was happening above them. Nobody seemed to notice him dangling above. Benny heard a squeak. Vanilla was clinging to the curtain with her teeth just a couple inches above his shoulder. Come here, girl, Benny whispered. Vanilla dropped down to his shoulder. She started preening her whiskers as if she had no care in the world. Benny knew he couldn't grip the curtain forever. He reached with his arm toward the dressing room opening. It was three feet too far away. He had no idea what to do. 
Suddenly, the lights on stage began to dim. One scene of Cyrano de Bergerac was ending before the beginning of the next. Benny realized everything was about to be in darkness. This was his chance. Hold on tight, Vanilla, whispered Benny. He dropped two feet, then another two feet, then another. The backstage was now completely in the dark. He quickened his pace, dropping as rapidly as possible. His fingers burned from the tension of gripping the curtain, but he couldn't risk taking a break. The lights on stage started to rise. He was going to get caught. Benny released his fingers a little more and quickly slid down the remaining distance. As the lights on stage got even brighter, Benny landed on the floor. Thump! There was no time to recover. Scooping Vanilla off his shoulder and into his pocket, Benny scampered further into the wings and crouched in a dark corner behind a chair. Benny pulled his knees into his chest to form a small, tight ball. He pressed his burning fingers and palms into his armpit and held them there, letting the burning sensation subside. Through the chair, Benny could see his uncle performing on stage, but Benny was far too distracted to be able to concentrate on whatever his uncle was saying. Benny couldn't think about anything except how to get out of this predicament. Chapter 6, The Spiral Staircase Suddenly, Benny felt something light hit his head. It bounced off his head and then into his lap. Benny picked up a small black comb. He looked up. Thirty feet above him, Salvador poked his head out of the dressing room opening, looking directly down the side of the brick wall with a look of alarm and confusion. They made eye contact. Salvador mouthed silently, What happened? Benny didn't know how to explain everything, so he shrugged his shoulders helplessly. Salvador motioned with his eyes that people were approaching. Benny ducked his head even lower as two actresses in wide, shiny dresses stood facing the stage with their backs to Benny. This was his chance. Benny crawled from behind the chair. He crawled as quietly and quickly as he could along the brick wall to the nearest doorway. He exited through the doorway, even though he had no idea where he was going. Then he found himself in a dark room with a small black spiral staircase leading down to somewhere below the stage. There was no other exit. All at once, he heard footsteps approaching the doorway. A yellow clipboard flashed into view. Victoria was approaching. Having nowhere else to go, Benny scampered down the spiral stairs. The steel steps circled down and down and down. When he arrived at the bottom, he was in complete darkness, except for a patch of bright light a good fifty feet in the distance. He looked to see if Victoria had followed. She hadn't. Don't be frightened, Vanilla, Benny whispered, even though his heart was thumping madly. Benny and Vanilla remained still and alert. They could hear the dull thudding of many people treading above him. Vanilla, we're directly beneath the stage. Benny adjusted his eyes to the darkness. It was too dark to see anything surrounding him, so he decided to head to that light. After a couple steps, his hip hit something metallic. The metallic thing tipped over and fell to the cement floor. Clang! Benny held his breath. The thudding above him continued. Benny crouched down and felt around for whatever he tipped over. It was thin and wiry and didn't weigh very much. After returning the thing to its upright position, he continued forward, bumping yet again into another similar metallic wiry thing. He seemed to be surrounded by them. It was so odd. Benny weaved his way in the dark through a maze of metal and wire. 
After a couple minutes, Benny finally made it to the lit area. Old black carpeting ran along the floor and up a curved wall. At the top of the curved wall rested a shiny wood railing. Wood chairs were scattered around. Benny crawled further into the light and looked up. The ceiling was no longer there. High above him, in a haze of amber light and shadows, a chandelier hovered in the distance. It shimmered beautifully with a thousand shards of glass. All at once, Benny knew exactly where he was. Just a couple feet above him was the edge of the stage, and just a couple feet on the other side of that curved wall was the audience. He and Vanilla were inside the orchestra pit. Above him, he heard a loud, strong voice. He looked up and saw his uncle standing above him at the edge of the stage. Uncle Riley gestured out to the audience as he spoke. He had no idea his nephew crouched just a couple feet under his boots. A bead of sweat rolled from Uncle's forehead down his large five-inch fake nose and dropped into the orchestra pit. Benny flattened as low as he possibly could to the carpeted floor. In the process, however, he lightly squished Vanilla in his pocket. Vanilla protested with a loud squeak. Benny moved his weight off Vanilla and glanced up to see if Uncle Riley had heard the squeak. To Benny's horror, his eyes met Uncle Riley's eyes. Chapter 7, The Audience Uncle Riley took in a quick breath and paused his speech. Benny grinned nervously. He gave his uncle a quick wave. Hello. Uncle Riley returned his eyesight forward to the audience and continued speaking. Benny could see Uncle Riley breathing a bit harder now. His voice sounded a lot more tense. Eight more beads of sweat dropped from Uncle Riley's nose into the orchestra pit. While flattened against the carpet, Benny had failed to notice that Vanilla had crawled out of his pocket. She was not happy. In defiance, she hopped onto a chair next to the curved wall. Vanilla, cried Benny as quietly as he could. Benny knew when Vanilla was in the mood, she'd begin an impossible game of chase, a game Benny could never win. Vanilla sprang up to perch on top of the shiny wooden rail, dividing the orchestra pit and the audience. Above him, Benny heard Uncle Riley inhale sharply, a gasp that sounded more like a hiccup. Benny reached for Vanilla, but she leaped over the curved wall into the audience. Oh no, cried Benny. There was nothing he could do until Vanilla decided to stop playing her game and return to him. Benny heard a woman scream. Vanilla must have landed on the lap or shoulder of one of the audience members. Suddenly, another woman shrieked, then another, and another. A man yelled, a mouse! More shrieks followed along with the shuffling of many panicked bodies rising out of their seats. Benny looked up at his uncle. Uncle Riley stared in shock out to the audience. One hand held up. Benny could hear the shrieking and shuffling increase, widening across the auditorium. Very slowly, Benny stood on a chair. He inched his way up the curved wall. He peeked his eyes above the shiny wood railing. In front of him, all Benny could see was a vast auditorium, jam-packed with people leaping to their feet, standing on chairs and screaming. Folding chairs whopped up and down as people hopped on and off them. Whop! Purses swatted the air at random. Whop! Jackets whipped through the air. Whop! People jumped over chairs towards exit doors. Whop! In the distance, Benny caught sight of Vanilla. She gleefully hopped from one shoulder to another, then onto someone's hat, and then back onto someone's shoulder. She burrowed into an old lady's pile of gray hair, emerged on the other side, and sprung onto a tall man's neck. The tall man shrieked and twisted around, slapping his hand to his neck. 
Vanilla squeaked in delight and leapt to a new person's shoulder. Screams followed gasps. Gasps followed cries. Cries followed swatting. Swatting followed bellows. People were evacuating the balcony as quickly as possible. A girl's white hairband flew into the air. A woman mistook that flying white thing as a mouse and swatted her large purse at it. The purse missed, hit someone's shoulder, and snapped open. All its contents spilled over the balcony and rained down on the people below. What's going on? cried a teenager as the small makeup container bounced off her head and brown powder exploded all around her. Is the balcony collapsing? We gotta get out of here, her parents yelled, yanking her toward an exit. One young man started giggling. He backed himself against a wall and began to film the hysteria on his phone. The whole theater was in a chaotic eruption of motion and noise. Vanilla was having the time of her life. She hopped into the shadows and disappeared. Vanilla, cried Benny, come back. Suddenly, Benny felt a hand on his shoulder. Chapter 8, Quasimodo. Benny turned around to face Salvador. Salvador urgently pulled him down into a crouching position. Follow me, he commanded. Salvador guided Benny back through the darkness, lighting the way with the flashlight of his cell phone. Benny could now see that the maze of wires he had wandered through were actually a whole collection of music stands used by musicians in the orchestra pit to hold their music scores. When they arrived at the bottom of the spiral staircase, Salvador ordered, Climb onto my back. Benny piggybacked onto Salvador's strong, thick back, wrapping his arms around his shoulders. Salvador then swung a large, dark red cape over them both and fastened it around his neck. He placed an elaborate hat on his head, decorated with enormous peacock feathers. Benny exclaimed, We look like Quasimodo. Salvador replied, See, Quasimodo snuck around the dark too, said Benny. See, except Quasimodo's story did not end happily, so don't make a sound. Salvador carried Benny up the spiral staircase. They emerged back on the stage. Through a small sliver of a gap between the cape and Salvador's shoulder, Benny could see actors rush around in confusion. Stage crew folks busily carried props from the stage into the wings. Salvador continued through the black framed doorway into that wide hall with all the doorways filled with people. Benny could feel the sweat drip from Salvador's neck down his back, making it terribly slippery and difficult for Benny to cling to. You're heavier than you look, Benny, grumbled Salvador. Benny heard people whisper, what's going on? Why is the audience panicked? Is there a fire? Is there a fight? Salvador rushed as fast as he could through a doorway and up a flight of stairs. Suddenly, Benny saw Victoria stomping down toward them with her yellow clipboard. He ducked even further behind Salvador's back, clinging even tighter around Salvador's neck, unintentionally choking him. Me estás ahorcando, strained Salvador. Salvador gasped for air. Victoria barked, move it! Salvador flattened against the wall, squashing Benny between his back and the brick. Victoria's footsteps continued down the stairs and around the corner. She's gone, Salvador gasped. Benny loosened his grip. Salvador took in a huge gulp of air and then continued up three flights of stairs back to Uncle Riley's dressing room. Just a little further, Benny, Salvador muttered under his breath. Benny could feel his fingers straining to clasp Salvador's shoulders. Finally, Benny heard a dressing room door open and close behind him. Drop, Salvador ordered. Benny dropped to the floor as the cape flew off. Salvador collapsed onto a chair, breathing hard. His face was red from effort. Benny crawled to the opening above the stage where all the trouble began and slid the door shut. Clunk! Suddenly... 
The dressing room door flew open. Uncle Riley strode in, slamming and locking the door behind him. He whipped off his cape, flung it to the floor, and stood tall above Benny, staring at him with stern, fixed eyes. Uncle Riley kept his eyes on Benny as he peeled off the fake nose and tossed it onto the table. Benny wanted to shrink small enough to disappear. The performance, Uncle Riley finally spoke, has been canceled. Want to know what the official explanation for the cancellation is? Benny nodded shyly. Because, Uncle Riley continued, somebody, nobody knows who, but somebody brought a mouse into the Majestic Park Theater. A white pet mouse with a pink tail, and it escaped. Does anyone here know to whom that mouse belongs? Yes, muttered Benny sheepishly. Luckily, Uncle Riley emphasized, nobody except the people in this room knows the actual truth. Luckily, Benny whispered, I'm sorry, Uncle Riley. What happened? demanded Uncle Riley. Benny explained his entire adventure, from the moment Vanilla crawled along the pipe to sliding down the curtain to escaping into the orchestra pit. You slid down the curtain, exclaimed Uncle Riley. You could have been killed. I'm sorry, are you mad at me? Uncle Riley paused before reacting deep in thought. Benny was so ashamed, he directed his eyes from his uncle to the black and white photo of Constance Collier. Something different caught Benny's eye. The photo appeared exactly the same, but Constant Collier's face now had a softer, reassuring look. Benny thought, am I imagining things? Benny blinked, and when he opened his eyes, he saw that her face had returned to its original stern expression. Benny blinked again. It remained stern. Well, he must have been mistaken. You know why I'm not mad at you, continued Uncle Riley. Why? asked Benny. Because, Uncle Riley answered, Scratch Litchington never wrote his review. The show was canceled and Scratch can't review what he never saw. You and Vanilla just might have saved the day. The three laughed. Uncle Riley opened his arms and welcomed Benny in a hug. Uncle Riley kissed the top of his head with a loud smack. I'm just glad you're safe, Benny, Uncle Riley added. But don't ever do that again. I won't, cried Benny. But... Yes? Uncle Riley, I'm, I'm scared something happened to Vanilla. I don't know where she is. Uncle Riley glanced over to Salvador for help. Salvador said softly, Don't worry, Benny. Vanilla will turn up. This old theater has a way of knowing who its friends are. Well, how can a theater know anything, Benny thought. It's just an old building. Salvador patted Benny's shoulder with a smile and asked, Who wants a strawberry cupcake? They'll go stale if we don't eat them. As Salvador distributed the cupcakes, the door burst open. Victoria entered. <laughs> Chapter 9, The Hero Victoria waved her yellow clipboard and blurted, They're closing the theater for the night in 30 minutes. This night is a disaster. A mouse! Never in my entire life! Somebody brought a pet mouse into a theater. Vile! Salvador added, I think mice are cute. Cute, Victoria charged. What's cute about a mouse shutting down an entire performance? What's cute about refunding all those tickets? Pets are disgusting, all of them. If I find that mouse, I'll feed it to a cat. Then I'll feed the cat to a dog. Then I'll feed the dog to a pig. Then I'll slice the pig into bacon and eat it with eggs for breakfast. That's a complicated recipe, Salvador muttered, just for a mouse omelette. 
I never said it, Victoria stuttered. How, how disgusting. Uncle Riley's face turned white in his struggle to hold back his laughter. Benny tried to hide his giggling by covering his mouth with his hands. Victoria's face turned red with frustration. Thirty minutes! blurted Victoria as she marched out the dressing room and slammed the door shut behind her. Se le van las cabras, exclaimed Salvador. She's losing her goats, <laughs> Uncle Riley translated. Benny really didn't know what that meant either, but he joined their laughter, all the tension of the evening released into the air. Thirty minutes later, after Uncle Riley removed his makeup, his wig, his mustache, and changed into regular clothes, the three exited the dressing room. The whole time, Benny kept expecting Vanilla to appear under the door, but she didn't. Benny was really worried. At the bottom of the last flight of stairs, Hudson Hayes stood in her baseball cap with a grin on her face. She motioned to Uncle Riley. Go ahead, boys, Uncle Riley said. I'll catch up. Uncle Riley and the director chatted in low tones as Salvador and Benny continued through the hall to the entryway. Other actors, whom Benny had just seen in fancy costumes and wigs, were now in regular jeans and jackets heading to the exit. Everyone chatted energetically about the mouse and the panicked audience. Jacob sat at his small desk and looked up as the two approached. It's been an exciting night, hasn't it? Jacob said. He lowered his glasses down the bridge of his nose and looked Benny right in the eye and lowered his voice. Did you and your friend have fun, Benny? Benny remembered Jacobs was the only other person in the Majestic Park Theater who knew about the existence of Vanilla. Before Benny could answer Jacobs' question, Uncle Riley appeared at his side with a mischievous smile on his face. Uncle Riley began, I have some good news. What's that? Jacobs asked. Uncle Riley placed his hands on Benny's shoulders and said, in only 30 minutes, the gossip about a pet mouse disrupting Cyrano de Bergerac spread across the theater community, across the city, across the state, across the country, and popped into news around the world. There are videos of hundreds of people hopping up on chairs and swatting away one single mouse all at the same time. It's not supposed to be funny, but the world is laughing anyway. In just 30 minutes, Cyrano de Bergerac has become the most talked about show in the world. Is that good? Benny asked nervously. Uncle Riley answered, Benny, at this point, any publicity is good publicity. Hudson informed me that because of one mouse, our website has more hits in 30 minutes than it received all year. And that, Salvador added, means only one thing. More sales? asked Benny. More sales, exclaimed Uncle Riley. People today love a little bit of wackiness. We've sold out every seat at the Majestic Park Theater for a month. Once these people see how good the show is, they'll spread the word even more. We've thought of everything to try to get young people to see Cyrano de Bergerac, but we never, ever thought of using a mouse. Jacobs reached his hand out and asked, Well, may I shake the hero's hand? Benny shook his hand shyly. Although he was happy to be called a hero, he couldn't smile. Where was Vanilla? Jacobs reached inside his pocket and continued, Do you know anyone who's missing a little critter like this? Jacobs withdrew Vanilla from his pocket. Vanilla, cried Benny. Vanilla squeaked in excitement and hopped on Benny's shoulder, licking Benny's neck with her tiny tongue. Jacob explained, I found her trying to scurry out. I have a feeling we ought to keep this just between the four of us, don't you? Por supuesto que sí, si, exclaimed Salvador. Absolutely, agreed Uncle Riley. Benny slipped Vanilla into his pocket. He looked up at Jacobs, Salvador, and Uncle Riley. 
Vanilla and he were surrounded by adults who welcomed them into their world and cared for them. All at once, Benny understood what Salvador meant earlier when he said, This old theater has a way of knowing who its friends are. He felt happier than he'd felt in a long time. Benny threw his arms around Jacobs in a tight hug and exclaimed, Thank you. The pleasure is mine, kid, Jacob said. Good night, Benny. Good night, Jacobs. Benny, Salvador, and Uncle Riley passed through the Majestic Park Theater stage door to the outside. Once again, Benny was engulfed by busy sounds of traffic, honking cars, and noisy people, a sort of non-stop New York City buzz that he'd soon come to love. Benny looked up past the tall gray columns of the Majestic Park Theater, past the sign with his Uncle Riley's name on it, all the way to the dark night sky beyond. Benny felt exhausted and energized at the same time. He reviewed in his mind the incredible adventure of that evening. The stage, the backstage, the wings, the orchestra pit, the dressing room, the people, Constance Collier, Vanilla, the audience. Then something occurred to Benny. He realized he'd hardly thought of his mom in the hospital all night. Maybe, Benny thought. That's exactly why Mom wanted Uncle Riley to look after me. Benny continued to ponder this idea as the three walked down the sidewalk deeper into the city's exciting and colorful sounds and activity. What Benny did not know at that moment is that he and his mother would never again return to live in Indianapolis. Benny did not know at that moment Uncle Riley's life of theater would soon become his life as well. Benny did not know at that moment that tonight's backstage adventure at the Majestic Park Theater on Broadway in New York City was just the first of many, many more to come. The end for now. You have been listening to Backstage Benny and the Majestic Park Theater, read by the author Daniel Tobias, music by Evan McDonald. To contribute to creating more adventures for our hero, Benny Beaumont, please consider supporting through a Patreon subscription or a one-time donation. Information is available at www.danieltobias.com. To learn more about the composer, visit www.evanmcdonaldmusic.com. Thank you for listening.